host of the KQED and nationally syndicated uh, radio program forum. For those of you who love satellite radio like I do, uh, Sirius XM as well. So um, many, many of you are probably here because you listen to him on a regular basis. But many of you don't know that he's also kind of a literary expert. So um, we're going to start. And then I, I think what he has in mind is that after he's through with his comments, that maybe this could be a little more interactive. So, um, so excited to be here. So excited that the Bob Kelly Endowment could fund this for us. So thank you to our emeritus colleague. Okay. Thank you. and. Uh it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I know we're competing with the Giants game, and uh, in many ways that's big competition for me too because I happen to be a very strong fan uh, of the Giants. It's hard to believe they're in the World Series. It's also uh, wonderful that they're in the World Series. And it's, uh, I hope, wonderful that I can come here and talk to you about Slaughterhouse-Five and Kurt Vonnegut. I should tell you that literary expert, well, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a literary guy. I have a PhD in English and American literature and have been teaching it for more years than I care sometimes to reflect on. Uh, and I thought I could perhaps do uh, what is not by any means an onerous task of talking about Slaughterhouse Five in both a literary and historical context, and then maybe um, uh, give you some notion of my own personal context with Kurt Vonnegut, who I had the good fortune of interviewing uh, at least on three occasions, once on stage and two other times on the radio, which uh, can be found in our archives. That's not a plug, just a fact. And I should mention that um, it's also, I think, something that ought to be brought to your attention, that this novel, and particularly the novels of Kurt Vonnegut, were considered kind of, uh, at one time, underground. It seems rather hard to believe now, because he's so much a part of the mainstream, and he's taught in so many courses in universities, not only here, but abroad. But there were some of us who sort of discovered Vonnegut, and we thought we were pretty hip in having discovered him. Uh, Slaughterhouse Five is probably, by most lights, his best novel and his most accomplished novel, but he has many others, as well as short stories, and as some of you know, uh, was a writer of, of pretty wide range and depth uh, of work. Uh, there was a fellow that I uh, did my PhD work with by the name of Jerome Klinkowitz, a name that used to make people kind of what a name that is, but um, he went on to be perhaps one of the best known scholars uh, on Vonnegut, and we thought we were cult readers of Vonnegut. Uh, Jerome Klinkowitz will always be memorable in my imagination and memory for the fact that he told me that he and his wife were going to get pregnant by drinking raspberry tea, and he had sent for these raspberry tea leaves. He suddenly made the connection between raspberry tea leaves and uh, fertility and came in the mail, and the postal authorities came to his home uh, ready to, uh, I guess, do some constabulatory uh, action because they thought the raspberry tea leaves were uh, cannabis. Um, so that's one of those things that stays in one's memory. But he went on to write a great deal about Vonnegut. In fact, he did, some of you may know, those little Twain books uh, that profile different writers, and his is the Twain book on Vonnegut. And we were kind of uh, miffed and, and, and a little bit thinking of ourselves as radical and heterodoxical in the fact that we saw Vonnegut as an important writer, and we really thought that uh, he was. And certainly by the time Slaughterhouse-Five came out, uh, 1970, he had pretty well established himself and had come from this underground upward. And like I said, it's pretty much memorable as perhaps by many lights, his best work, by most critical lights. It's also a work of metafiction. It, kind of, it really breaks down the third wall, and it does some things that are quite innovative and experimental, as I'm sure many of you know. First of all, you have an intrusive narrator who comes in, who is Vonnegut, and you have um, that narrator who speaks directly to you. That's what I mean by breaking down the third wall. Now, this has a long tradition in literature written in the English language. It goes all the way back, for those of you who know the history of the novel, to writers like Fielding and Defoe, who would say, and now gentle reader, and make your, themselves, or make you as a reader aware of their presence. Uh, there is that sense of also, however, the avant-garde and the experimental and the innovative in particularly a work like Slaughterhouse-Five. It's not because it's science fiction. In fact, 
there was and probably remains a lot of uh, what I would describe as snobbery about science fiction. There's even snobbery about American literature, which I'll get to perhaps in the course of my lecture to you. But, um, and I do not want only to lecture to you, by the way. I want to bring you into this, and I'll tell you how I'm going to do that as we move along here. But there was uh, and continues to be a notion that science fiction doesn't really make it in the literary hierarchy, in the higher echelons of literary hierarchy, that science fiction is something, in other words, that shouldn't be taken seriously. Uh, now, many of you who are science fiction lovers may find that offensive, and particularly if you like writers like Ray Bradbury or some of the more notable science fiction writers, but there was at this time really only one science fiction book that had made its mark in the universities and was widespread taught, and that was a novel by Ursula Le Guin called Left Hand of Darkness that certainly had become a part of most curricula um, and was a novel, interestingly enough, also about seeing the future and also uh, a novel that had a good deal of fatalism in it. I want to um, talk about what we ought to look for, first of all, when we read any work of literature, let alone a novel that may be somewhat innovative or experimental. First of all, we go all the way back to the Romans, Horace, who said, any work of literature should instruct and please. Different ways of translating that, but that's basically what he had to tell us, and it has come down to us as something as important as, let's say, Aristotle's views of literature or any traditional views of literature that we teach. And the idea of a book like Slaughterhouse-Five or any work of, of Vonnegut's in terms of entertainment is pretty clear. I mean, you really were entertained by the novel and found yourself, I mean, entertained in the sense of being caught up in the plot and wanting to read further and engaged by it, stimulated by it. Most of you, I presume, and that is indeed most hands going up. But th then you get in the question of how do novels or how does any work of literature instruct us? And I want to talk about that. I want to address that in the course of my talking about Slaughterhouse-Five and Kurt Vonnegut. But I also want to talk first of you as an old veteran teacher of literature about really what comes down in my mind as four ways to look at any work of literature. If a literature or work of literature is supposed to please and instruct us, as Horace said, then how do we look at a work of literature critically? Well, I mean, there are a lot of ways. There are a lot of schools of criticism. You know, you can look at a literature from a feminist lens, from a psychoanalytic lens, from a Marxist lens, uh, and uh, from what they call new criticism and deconstruction. There are a whole variety of methodologies that apply to what we call critical theory. But I like to break it down to four things. I like to break it down to the text itself, and not only the text and what we read in the text and how we interpret it and analyze it, and go through what we call sometimes just old-fashioned explicacion, the text, that is explaining the text and what it means metaphorically and literally, but also intertextuality. How is this text related to other texts? What's its connection to other texts? And I want to talk about that too, to an extent. But we also look at a text in terms of the author and the author's life. That's called the genetic approach to literature. And certainly it's hard to escape this when looking at Slaughterhouse-Five because, as most of you know, uh, Kurt Vonnegut was indeed uh, held as a prisoner of war in a slaughterhouse in Dresden and was able to move from that experience, but of course, how does one move from autobiographical experience when one is writing fiction, which is essentially a lie, made up story? Well, it's somehow a melding or a hybridization, and that I think is important to keep in mind. That is, there are elements of Vonnegut's own experience in Slaughterhouse-Five, but don't mistake it as Vonnegut is Billy Pilgrim, because Billy Pilgrim is really a kind of alter ego for Vonnegut. Billy Pilgrim can be seen in the light of a story, a tale, a novel. And the imagination takes over in fiction. The imagination, as I said, is a precursor to essentially a kind of alternate state of consciousness or being where the author is making up things. He may be using a certain fulcrum to do with his own life, but nevertheless, it's fiction. It's why we call it fiction. Can be close to, in fact, sometimes it's what we call a Romana clay. It's so close to the actual autobiography or the truth that you can see people disguised as real people in the novel. But that's not Slaughterhouse Five. And yet we learn a lot about Vonnegut from this novel. We learn a lot about his way of thinking, about his philosophy, and to some extent that's where the didactic comes in. That's where he has things to teach us and really wants to teach us things. It's not to say that he's getting on his high horse or his podium or uh, talking to us, uh, as they say in the Vatican ex cathedra, from the seat of authority. It's just that literature can indeed and should embody ideas. And Slaughterhouse-Five does. And I want to talk about those ideas as well. But I want to also talk about the other two ways of looking at a work. If you can look at a work at its textually and intertextually, just the language and the work itself, the characters, the plot, all of the elements of the work, 
Or if you can look at it from the author's life, what other ways do you imagine you can look at it? If you break it down, I would submit to you that you can look at it in terms of what we call the mimetic. That is, what does the work tell us about what we call reality? What does it reflect as a mirror to life or as a way of conveying or representing or characterizing elements that we understand and need to feed our own sensibilities as well as our own education and understanding. That's a didactic again. And one other element, it's called reader response. How the work affects you. You, it's not the author, it's not the work itself, it's not necessarily even reality, it's you as the reader. And I wanna get into this later with you and talk about ways that Slaughterhouse-Five might have affected you. And uh, I think there are ways that perhaps I can perhaps maybe be of some assistance or guidance here, I hope so. But it's important to realize that in many ways, Vonnegut is tempting us to read this book in a very didactic way. Why? He gives the characters allegorical names. Even Billy Pilgrim, you know, echoes John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, or it echoes Chaucer's Pilgrim's going to Canterbury. It has all of that intertextuality flavor to it, and even when you think about it, uh, Vonnegut gave it this subtitle, which I'm sure some of you know, uh, The Children's Crusade, A Duty Dance with Death. Uh, and by the way, I can't help thinking of something personal. This book affects me because when I was a boy, I had a grandfather, uh, may he rest in peace, who was a butcher and who took me to a slaughterhouse and he said, this is what life is really about. Now, whoa, you know, to put that on a kid. But to some extent, you know, and so it goes. I mean, death after death, carnage after carnage. I mean, this subtitle even evokes for us a history that we have to understand. The Children's Crusade was an actual 15th century event where children marched or were marching from France and Germany from Europe to Jerusalem, and they were going to join the Crusades, and they were going to die in battle. And we're talking about children, like fight in Africa, Sierra Leone, and places like that in this day and age of ours. And it was just a, a complete and utter catastrophe, as one might imagine, Nic led by Nicholas Cologne. Uh, and a duty dance with death comes from, as some of you perhaps know, Celine. And what it particularly heightens is Vonnegut's recognition of something that became preeminent in the period that this book was written. And this gets into the book's his historicity. And that is the recognition of not only the inevitability of death, because we've always probably recognized that going back to ancient times, but the pervasive sense of death's randomness and the sense of death's being able to hit anyone at any time in a random way. And particularly, of course, one sees this in war. Some of you who have read your Hemingway may remember in A Farewell to Arms, uh, character gets wounded because he's taking cheese to somebody, you know, and then he's decorated for that. And he, well, wait a minute, all he was doing is bringing cheese to someone. But, you know, you can get hit by a stray bullet. You can get hit now by a drone. I mean, war is essentially something that knows no boundaries in terms of the individuals who are killed in it. But it's also a, really an existential recognition. And you have to understand this book in many ways as a result of the time it was written. It's not only that it was written in time of war, Vietnam War, but it, and I'll get to that. But it was also written at a time when existentialism became more and more dominant, predominant in many ways, in terms of cultural thinking. It started, of course, in France and it had a breeding ground there, but it was very much a transatlantic way of thinking. How I many are familiar or have read Sartre or Camus? Uh, I mean, and Nietzsche. Any readers of Nietzsche? <laughs> uh, I mean, Nietzsche is re uh, really sort of embedded in uh, what um, Billy Pilgrim learns from those uh, strange aliens who are shaped like toilet plungers about the, uh, the nature of eternal return, how things just keep going back and over and over again in recurrence. Uh, Nietzsche called that eternal return. But it's the existential ideas, and the ideas not only of the inevitability of death, but the absurdity of life in the face of death. You know, Camus, who wrote the myth of Sisyphus, used that myth, the myth that some of you may be familiar with, where Sisyphus is condemned, of course, to roll that huge boulder up a hill, and every time he gets to the top, it catapults him down, and he has to do that throughout eternity. Talk about eternal return. Can you imagine just ro rolling a boulder up a hill and just being cast down every time and having to roll it over and over again, ad infinitum, ad nauseum? Well, that's at the heart of this novel in many respects, that idea of not only repetition, but the absurdity of life. And the absurdity of life was really what Camus described as the human condition. And remember, this is a time when Waiting for Godot and so many works were having influence on the imagination and on human consciousness, and a lot of them had to do with just this existential sense of 
how random life could be and how death could strike one violent death at any time. Uh, and there really is not only that sense of violence and death that's obviously pervasive in Slaughterhouse-Five, but also of apocalyptic uh, recognition. I mean, we're in a nuclear age, we're in an atomic age, and the idea that the future may indeed hold destruction, not only for Billy, but for civilization not, and for the Tramlephorians, uh, is implicit in reading uh, this novel. So you ask yourself, if the novel is all about these uh, existential models that we have of death and violence, uh, what is it that gives us pleasure in the novel? What do, we, uh, what do we recognize as something that we enjoy? That's where it gets into the effect in part question or the reader response part question. And although there's also a very simple and kind of categorical answer to that, it's funny. I mean, Vonnegut was one of the, not one of the first, but one of the really first contemporary practitioners of what came to be known as black humor. That doesn't mean Chris Rock, by the way. You know. uh, black humor means, and, and it's an unfortunate use of the word black perhaps, but it means humor that comes out of a sense of darkness, despair, anguish, the human condition being tied to uh, mortality that is inevitable and random in the way that it uh, selects its victims and so forth, and also the recognition of war. And this recognition of war has also some real intertextual roots, goes back to Stephen Crane in American literature, or if you want a more modern example, Norman Mailer, and of course Hemingway before him. Uh, Vonnegut's writing out of a tradition. It's an American literary tradition. He's also writing out of a philosophical tradition that's been established vis-a-vis -vis existentialism and the existential thinkers. And he writes an allegory. He writes, in other words, a novel that wants to teach and that has a moral exemplar behind it for you, the readers. Now, why is this period so existential and so almost bordering on nihilistic with the views of absurdity? It's because we not only had the wars that we were ravaged by, the First World War, which is one of the stupidest wars of mankind, the Second World War, which was a war of horror, and of course, the Vietnam War. And Vonnegut, as a German-American, was also mindful, of course, of all those innocents who died in the firebombing of Dresden. And that was a story that was not necessarily told that much because you have your narratives that are told by the victors and you have different narratives that are told by those who were vanquished. He was an American soldier, he was a POW, but he was also of German ancestry and identified with his German heritage. So we're at a time when Vonnegut very much is a product of his own cultural and historical time. And where loss of religion and more secularization was endemic, was really a part of the veritable landscape that we're looking at at this time. And the historical reality of German suffering was something that he wanted to teach us, to, to have us learn. Now, by the way, the 135,000 civilians that died in the firebombing of, of Dresden is probably a figure that's inflated. It's been repudiated, in fact, uh, as not being fact. It came from a, a historian by the name of David Irving. I say historian advisedly. Anybody know about David Irving? who he was? Well, he, he was a Holocaust denier. He went on trial in, uh, in the United Kingdom for uh, denying the Holocaust and was found guilty. Um, it's, uh, that, nevertheless, he did some good historical work. And the numbers here get sort of strange. I mean, one innocent death is too many, if you'll forgive me for sermonizing, but it was more likely probably 24 to 40,000 people who died uh, in the destruction of Dresden. Uh, and Billy Pilgrim uh, comes out of it in the same way that Vonnegut came out of it. You know, Vonnegut was in a meat locker in the basement. Uh, and again, there's a kind of, well, perhaps attraction to this in many people's minds to say, oh, it happened to Vonnegut, so again, Billy Pilgrim is just Vonnegut disguise, disguised for us. But no, um, not the case at all. Vonnegut, by the way, enlisted, as some of you may know, uh, in the war after, soon after his mother's suicide. Uh, he um, not only survived the firebombing, he survived uh, and as a prisoner, but he also survived the duties that were assigned to him, which eventually uh, came out as burying uh, those bodies that had to be found and burned. And you can imagine, or perhaps you can't imagine, I mean, living here in Santa Rosa, as many of you do, <laughs> or living a, a fairly um, life, we hope, free of strife and, and trauma, what these kind of traumas can do to one. 
what they can do to turn the imagination. It's not only the existentialism, in other words, that we're talking about here. I said you look at a novel and you look at it in terms of its biographical and autobiographical influences, the cultural influences and the historical influences. All of this may be outside of the realm of the text, but it's exceedingly important, and Vonnegut was, was, was clearly damaged by what he went through. But you know, like Rilke said, the great poet, Rainer Rilke, a German poet, my devils are my angels. And if it hadn't been for what he had been through, the trauma, the horror, probably Slaughterhouse-Five never would have been written. And he had to give himself a lot of writing before he even could get to Slaughterhouse-Five. He had to write not only a number of novels, but some of the stories that he became famous for and so forth. So when you're in an existential world, and when you're in a world that is uh, ubiquitous with uh, random death occurring and violence occurring, and maybe the only thing that comes out of that is the, uh, uh, the only salvation is a kind of dark humor that we find in Slaughterhouse-Five. And by the way, this dark humor Goes, has some antecedents in American literature as well. Uh, Nathaniel West and Flannery O'Connor, but even more contemporary figures like Thomas Pynchon, uh, Bruce J. Friedman. Uh, you're also stuck with the whole question of free will. And, and you can see Vonnegut really engaging that question to a great degree in Slaughterhouse-Five. I remember an interview I did with a Nobel laureate uh, writer, Isaac Bashev, singer a number of years ago on stage at the Herbst Theater, and I was a young interviewer and a young uh, broadcast journalist or whatever you want to call it, talk show host. And I said to him with, with, with utter seriousness, uh, uh, Mr. Singer, do you believe in free will? And he said, I have no choice. Well, um, <laughs> what we're talking about here is not only the, the whole complex conundrum, you know, the, the uh, very difficult to solve riddle and mystery of free will when we read Slaughterhouse-Five, free will versus determinism. I mean, there is a kind of deterministic universe that were given by, uh, by Kurt Vonnegut. And you have to ask yourself, um, what is he trying to teach us there? What is he trying to show us about the nature of uh, our free will? Perhaps how irrational the universe is, which is pretty much consonant with what the existentialists believe. How, uh, going back all the way to the Greeks, there is a sense of determinism shaping our destiny and pretty much controlling our future, whether we like to think so or not. But I want you particularly to be aware of the absurdity that's communicated in the novel and the sense of trauma that comes through as well. Because World War II was a trauma. It was a trauma for the Jews, it was a trauma for the Roman people, the gypsies, it was a trauma for the Japanese who were bombed, of course, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and it was a trauma for the Germans, and a trauma really for so many throughout Europe, for the Russians, uh, who, had it not been for their winter once again like Napoleon, would have perhaps been defeated, we know now, for most of our historians. And here's Vonnegut bringing us into this whole sensibility, really, in Slaughterhouse-Five, as well as using his imagination in an inspired way to give us a story that we become involved in. And also, once again, breaking a number of conventions. Believe it or not, I mean, Billy Pilgrim is what we call an anti-hero. Uh, you know, the anti-hero was a figure that kind of came on the scene rather abruptly with a novel that is one of the best-selling novels of all time by J.D. Salinger called Catcher in the Rye, Holden Caulfield being kind of a prime example of the anti-hero. But suddenly the whole idea of the hero, going back to Aristotle, you know, falling from a high place like King Lear or Oedipus, is transformed. You know, you have, late, right after the Second World War, you have Willie Loman by Arthur Miller, Death of a Salesman. Hardly a hero, a low man, but nevertheless someone whom we are made to sympathize with, a kind of anti-hero everyman. And that's, I think, it's difficult to talk about author intention because, again, I'll put on my literary uh, scholarly hat here. There was a pa paper that came out in the late 50s by a couple of critics named Beardsley and Whimsett, and they said, they called it the intentional fallacy. How can we really know, they said, what an author's intention is? How can you really divine that? You don't know, even if the author says, right, they're fiction writers, they're liars. So the author says, this is my intention. You know, you can't necessarily find it credible. And I like the idea of the intentional fallacy, but I think you can see where some of the intentionality is on Vonnegut's part, where he's trying to give you an anti-hero. He's trying to give you a whole satirical view. I mean, when you look at Billy's life in suburban America, you know, with the Cadillac and the barbershop uh, quartet and that whole world of optometrists and everything. This is satire. This is satire that in some ways anticipates some of the satire of Cheever and Updike and some of those uh, really 
uh, important contemporary figures, uh, I'm not saying Vonnegut is not important, he certainly is, but who became even more important because of the way they portrayed the suburbs. Uh, this is also an apocalyptic novel. Apocalyptic, why? Well, have any of you read Cat's Cradle? I mean, it's not the only apocalyptic novel of, um, uh, of Vonnegut's, but notice what he foresees. You know, hydrogen bomb by the Chinese, there's the atomic age again, universe, uh, according to the uh, Tramformordians, uh, destroyed by one of their uh, test pilots. Um, but also within the novel, uh, within, and you don't have to be futuristic uh, or go into the fantasy of the novel. Within the novel, there's you know, a plane crash, a car crash, and so forth. And the refrain is, so it goes. You know, it's almost a kind of res res resignation. It's an acquiescence to fate, to the power of fate, and to the inability of those of us with a free will, regardless of how much we think we have the strength and the vibrancy and the power of free will to overcome our destiny, which is death. Which is death that can come with its cold hand at any time, any place, anywhere, whether we like it or not, and particularly in times of war and places of war. So this is an anti-war novel. If there's something to teach us at the same time that we're entertained, it's the horror of war and the unacceptability of war in a moral way. And make no mistake about it, it's a moral novel. It, in fact, instructs us in a moral way. Like I said, it has all the elements of allegory to it. And what is it instructing us in? It's instructing us in something that we need to know or perhaps ought to constantly remind ourselves of, and that is the horror of war. But there's also this sense of disorder and randomness. And again, that gets back to the existentialism, the jumble of time, the whole nature of trying to grapple with the metaphysics of time and how spontaneous it is and how it's experienced in a kind of spontaneous way. And in a sense, Vonnegut is not reinventing the novel, but he's creating his own universe. I mean, it was Hegel who said to us that a work of art is like a universe unto itself and exists as a universe unto itself. I just had a rather uh, spirited conversation again at Herb's Theater uh, earlier this week with two uh, Nobel Prize winning physicists and uh, Sal Perlmutter and um, George Smoot, if you know those names, and they were talking about the end of the universe and they were speaking about the fact that, I mean, this is heavy duty stuff, you know, it can make your head spin. It's like talking about uh, uh, string theory. They're speaking about the end of the universe in terms of cosmology, you know, and the whole idea that is now pretty scientific about being able to measure the universe, go back and measure the Big Bang and go back or go forward and find out to what extent uh, the sun is no longer going to have its power and those kinds of things. And they can actually quantify these sorts of things. Now, Vonnegut, you know, he's not a scientist, but he's looking in the light of not only atomic energy, but in the light of entropy and the discovery of laws of physical nature and laws of the universe. The universe was believed to be slowing down. Now we have these physicists saying, well, no, it's accelerating. Uh, but still, there's thermodynamics to deal with, which pretty much give evidence to the notion that the universe is perhaps moving towards some kind of ultimate destruction, unless you believe like the string theorists that are, how many universes out there? Who knows? There may be a parallel universe now in which the giants lost the first game, and you know, I don't know. I don't know, I can't vouch for it. But, you know, if there's a fourth dimension and there's time travel and all those kinds of things which uh, cosmologists and physicists have been speculating about uh, for so long now, then make no mistake about it, we don't know. And here's Vonnegut experimenting, writing about nonlinearity in time, writing really through characters who are not that well developed because they're more allegorical characters. They're what E.M. Forrester called flat characters or cartoon characters. And I don't mean that to take away from the accomplishment of the novel, but there's a sense that uh, Vonnegut is there to tell us a story that will, as I said, not only entertain us, keep us amused, uh, keep us turning pages, compel us, but also have some lessons for us as well. And so it goes. Even Billy Pilgrim's death is absurd. You know, uh, It's almost a kind of uh, satire of revenge being sweet and all of that sort of thing, um, the murder by Paul Lazar. There, there's, in other words, a strong moral sense in this novel of the stupidity of violence and the methods and the means that violence and conflict uh, representing those forms of violence have come down on a one-to-one -one level or on the bigger, more macro scale of wars. Also, I think it's safe to say that this is a good story. It's a good tale. And it draws us in, and it entertains us, but it also keeps us reading 
because there's a story to tell. In other words, I don't know how many of you have tried your hand at writing fiction, let alone a novel. I have. Uh, and um, I can tell you, like my colleague Terry Gross in Public Radio once said to me, she said, I was an aspiring novelist, and I said, oh, really, so was I. Uh, what happened? Uh, and she said, well, I guess I didn't hear those voices. And I said, well, I guess I didn't either. Um, I mean, you, when you write a story, when you write a good story, a good narrative, a compelling narrative, and you know, it can be schlocky too. Uh, I just read Gone Girl when I was in Spain. Best-selling novel, but boy, it keeps you moving the pages and everything. You get caught up in it. You identify with the characters, and you wonder what's going to happen next. Vonnegut can tell a good story. I mean, there's a gift there. There's just a talent there that, that, that can't be denied. Uh, but I think it's also important to realize that there is a sense of trying to create a different kind of novel and going beyond the boundaries of what's considered or what not only is conventional, I talked about the intrusive narration and those kinds of things, but also what's considered high literature. Because science fiction wasn't given that accord and still isn't to a great extent. Uh, I've been teaching at San Francisco State, teaching literature courses for many, many years, and uh, I have a, co a colleague, George Tuma, who also happens to be a minister, and he will tell you that um, there's a snobbishness among our colleagues about the fact that he teaches science fiction courses, and includes Slaughterhouse-Five, by the way. <laughs> this is an important novel. It's an important novel in the American canon, and it deserves more respect, in my judgment. But it's also a good tale, a good story, and Vonnegut has that gift, that talent of being a good storyteller. Uh, and I've got to ask Mark, is there a score in the game? Uh, check that if you'd be so kind. Um, well, we'll find out soon enough. Um, it's, I mean, I like talking to you about Slaughterhouse-Five and everything, but you know, I had said that there are inventions in this novel in different ways of using the form that I wanted to call your attention to. There was, at this time, a notion that the, uh, the novel had kind of reached the end of the road. John Barth, in fact, some of you may recognize the name, Floating Opera and Giles Goat Boy, famous uh, and highly regarded literary figure in American literature, said, we can't push this form any more than we already have. Uh, Ulysses by James Joyce was recognized as kind of the sine qua non, you know, the best the, one, the most consummate novel, took us to the end, and how could the novel be reinvented? Vonnegut is trying, I think, ambitiously to sort of reinvent the novel in his own way here. Not only tell a good story, but also give us a sense of uh, breaking with conventions and using methods that weren't considered, frankly, high literature. It's not only because it's science fiction and because, you know, you have these absurd things like aliens looking like toilet plungers and all that, but also because, and, and the names, uh, I mean, not only Billy, Richard Weary, you know, the jingoistic guy, you have names that are right out of an allegory, and it's like he wants to fuse the allegorical with a lot of the more conventional kinds of literary techniques and methods that are used in the novel and that became commonplace in the novel. Uh, I had said that I wanted to talk also a little bit about my own experiences with Vonnegut, and I had the good fortune to interview him a number of times, three times actually, um, all at different phases. And I asked him about Slaughterhouse-Five and talked to him uh, at some length about it, both on stage and on air and um, off the air and off stage. And let me just say, by way of introduction, that he's a very genial man. You know, you, you, there are certain people that you cotton to and you like right away because they seem to you to be uh, this is my judgment, perhaps, but it may be yours as well. They just seem to be nice people, you know? They seem to be kind people and reasonable. It's funny because Slaughterhouse-Five is all about the lack of reason. <laughs> you know, it's all about the irrationality in the world we live in and uh, not only the wars, but the irrational violence and senselessness of so many things that happen randomly. But he seems not only a reasonable man, he seemed not only a reasonable man to me, he was a reasonable man. Um, and... Um, it was the kindness that struck me on all occasions of interviewing him. Plus, as you might imagine, an ironic sense. Now, I did a whole book a number of years ago that Stanford Press published called Off Mike, uh, subtitled a, um, a Memoir of Talk Radio and Literary Life. And I was writing about how you meet writers in the flesh and they're very different than when you meet them 
in the text or vice versa. You meet a writer in the text and they don't necessarily strike you in, in real protoplasm uh, in their human forms as the way they come across in their uh, artist uh, literary forms. But Vonnegut, I always thought probably uh, was a genial good soul and he came across that way and also ironic and, and skeptical. Some writers who are funny are not funny when you meet them. Vonnegut was funny. Uh, and yet there was a kind of, particularly toward the uh, last interview, there was a kind of weltschmerz uh, or world weariness about him. Um, he is a, a chain smoker, by the way, and it's tough to have someone in a studio for an hour who's a chain smoker because they kind of go out of their minds without smoking. Um, Sean Penn uh, would not do an interview with me because he said he couldn't sit for an hour without having a cigarette. We have rules against smoking at uh, the NPR, NPR station, KQED, where I work. So uh, I could tell, you know, Vonnegut, as soon as he got out of there, he went out like at full speed and got to where he could smoke. Um, but more power to him to put up with the hour, uh, I guess, or less power to him that he was still a habitual smoker. Anyway, um, kind man and a man who had an irony about himself and also a sense of, well, in the third interview, which is perhaps in some ways the most memorable one, because it was really right before his death, he said, I don't think I'm gonna write anymore. I think I've written all that I have to write. I wanna do gardening and hang around with my brother and so forth. But yet, his last novel came out soon after that. Um, and he made some jokes about that as well. Uh, that was our last interview. Let me tell you something. Early on in reading, Vonnegut has stayed with me for a lifetime. I mean, there's certain writers who give you that precious gift of an aphorism or a character or something that's particularly memorable. And since I happen to be in the process now of writing another book, I found myself uh, thinking about this particular line of Vonnegut's, which has come down to me, and I simply want to pass it on to you. Um, I mean, how many of you now, for example, find yourself thinking, before I tell you what that line is, you, you read about deaths or you read about you know, shootings in uh, Iraq or Syria or wherever, and say, so it goes, right? I don't know if you have that response, but I've had that response through the years. It's almost that sense of irony and fatalism that's so characteristic of coming away from reading a book like Slaughterhouse-Five. And by the way, it's, let me just be intertextual for a moment, it's something that we find to a great degree in a writer like Mark Twain. I mean, in fact, there are a lot of analogies between Vonnegut and Twain, both in terms of parody and satire and humor and uh, the irony that they work in, but also with their sense of the stupidity of the human animal, the stupidity for the irrationality and the violence especially, that what can you do? You have that resignation, you shrug your shoulders and you say, so it goes. Well, the line for me from Vonnegut was, you are who you pretend to be. And why has that always stayed with me? Because in many respects, if you think about it, the, the, the self that you form, and there are many levels of self, and the self is protean, and it changes, and you know, it's multiple and all that, but if there's a core to our self, we form it often on the basis of how we present ourselves, self-presentation. And the idea that if you're gonna to pretend to be someone or something that you are not, and you have to pretend that <laughs> before you become that, then that's what you become. Does that make sense to you? I mean, it's almost you know, a little bit um, uh, mysterious, I, I think, or more mysterious than, uh, than I believe it is in, uh, in the way I'm presenting it, but you are who you pretend to be simply means you take a certain role in life and you become that role. You make certain choices to be, let's say, a student, a teacher, a fireman, a policewoman, whatever it may be, and suddenly you're in that role. Suddenly you have to become whatever it is that you're supposed to be. And in a sense, there's a pretending that goes on about that. Marlon Brando was also a great teacher. Uh, he said, you know, acting, it's easy. Well, it's not. But he said, all you have to do is uh, pretend to be something and then be it. And that's true about many things in life. Okay, what I want to ask you, I was told, I'm sorry, I'm talking longer than I should have. I was told to talk about, I think, 30 minutes or so. But I really want to hear from you how, go, going back to the effect of a novel, which I said is one way to judge it. And by the way, make no mistake about this, you not only want as readers to critique a novel 
to be critical about it, to interpret it, to analyze it, but also to judge it. Don't be afraid of judging a novel. I'm not asking you so much to make a judgment here. I'm asking you, how did this novel affect you? When you really get down to the core of how you responded as a reader, did it have an effect on you? And if so, can you describe it? Can you characterize it? Can you delineate it for me, what that effect was? How did it affect your imagination, your sensibility, your consciousness, your inner life, your interior life, your emotions, or your thoughts? Obviously, I'm trying to convey to you the importance of what this novel has to teach from Vonnegut's point of view, if we know intentionality, which we ultimately don't, perhaps, but can guess at and be reasonable about. What does the novel have to teach you? Or in what ways did it affect you? Just feel free and uninhibited here to let everybody know, if you would be so kind. When you think about the novel, when you look at it in retrospect, what was its effect on you? This is what we call reader response. How did you respond to it? Anybody? You don't have to be shy with it. I'm just, an ordinary guy. I know I gave you a little bit of a highly ordinary lecture that I do. Second question was the short and going through the second time and trying to find my way through in terms of the time that I jump all over the place. I kind of felt like I came a little bit unstuck. Like you came a little bit unstuck in time? I was moving around, but I was losing track of where I was. But that's a great response. I mean, because indeed, I think, again, if we're looking at the possibility of intentionality here, he wants you to feel that. That's yeah. exactly what the novel does. How do you actually felt that? Like you're jumping around in time and the novel is doing to you as a reader what Vanya is doing to Billy? Exactly what the point. Okay, now let's say not necessarily interpretation. When I ask you how it affected you, did you like it? Well, ask yourself, Simple question. If you liked it, why did you like it? Or if you didn't like it? It was a snooze to you. You know, ah, time travel, that's bullshit. <laughs> uh, tell me what affected you either way. Yes. The first time I read it when I was a uh, young woman, uh, I got really, I got totally turned off by the sci fi stuff. And so I would literally, you know how you skip around a novel, you're like, oh, I'll just kind of turn off for this. Because I really was, the other part seemed so vivid. And this time, I, I mean, I was sitting, you know, when it, on a rainy night in my bathrobe, and like, and I just read way longer than I should have, and I totally got, I, I started to um, understand. I, I started to become pre and really interested in this planet <laughs> and these aliens, and they became as real to me as the very vivid prisoner of war going in the snow, you know, the guy, you know, the train scene, and, and I thought that was really interesting. And I, and, I, and I don't know quite what to make of it. Was it the bathroom, do you think? <laughs> 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 well, no. It was just interesting. I thought, okay, well, this time, why now am I willing to entertain, you know, uh, a planet and aliens and the train? Well, what, was the, what was the year difference, in, in, if I might ask, uh, the two I readings would, you I did? Would, I would say probably 30 years. Yeah. So what can I have? First of all, you might be a better reader, a more observant reader. And by the way, if, if you read Hamlet in high school and you're reading it now in college, it's a different play. I mean, as you mature and as you get older, uh, you read any work of literature, it's going to have a different effect on you. But what happened to you is pretty dramatic. And what happened to you in terms of reader response may have had to do with just being attuned more to the language, perhaps in part from reading it the first time. And suddenly things, are, chords are struck in your memory and filaments are kind of ignited in your memory. And what went back to the first time as displeasure is suddenly more pleasurable as a read. That's, Perfect response, yes. Well, I, I keep saying to myself, uh, there's something I shouldn't forget. That's, that's, one, that's my biggest response. There's something, something really important that I, might, that I might overlook and I shouldn't forget. That's so you felt that you were missing something there and you couldn't quite grasp it or get a hold of it? No, 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 not, not that I shouldn't forget about the novel, but that I shouldn't forget about um, World War II. Or shouldn't forget about man's inhumanity. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were saying there's something I should get. Something you, you oh, shouldn't forget. forget. That I shouldn't forget. Something that I shouldn't forget. Forget. And that's that lesson of inhumanity in war, yeah? Yeah, that, 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 I, that, that I was in danger of overlooking that to some extent. Of course, it can be painful sometimes, too, to bring that graphic recognition into your mind. I mentioned. Uh, since we're talking about a German-American writer, and I mentioned Milka, I'll mention another German writer, Bertolt Brecht, you know the name? Famous uh, epic theater playwright in Germany after the war, and uh, he said, the man who laughs has not yet been told the terrible news. 
Now, that's a pretty yeah. troubling thing to reckon with. Uh, but what he meant was open the papers and what do you see? I mean, you see just this mindless violence all over the map, globally, every region of the world, and wars going on everywhere, and people dying. Uh, you know, what they used to call during Vietnam. This phrase became important. I say Vietnam, emphasizing and highlighting, because remember, Monica was writing out of that particular time span, in that particular period, what was called collaborative damage. Have you heard that phrase? Uh, collaborative damage, a drone goes into Pakistan and collateral? Collateral damage. Collateral damage, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, now I'm mishearing you, I'm misspeaking myself here. <laughs> collateral damage means, you know, in Vietnam they were using that term to describe people who were killed, you know, uh, who um, happened to be where they were dropping bombs, or napalm, or whatever the fact may have been. Uh, and we still hear that phrase now with drones. I mean, whatever your feelings are about this election, I'm not trying to color anybody's ideas or anything. It's, uh, this is by no means a brief for, uh, for or against President Obama. President Bush used a lot of drone warfare too, but it's become much more commonplace. President, now Obama took us out of two wars, and that's been a main part of his election campaigning. Took us out of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, will take us out of Afghanistan. Nevertheless, he's sending drones into Pakistan, he's sending drones into uh, Somalia, uh, into the Sudan, the southern part of the Sudan. And what does this mean? It means that innocent people, collateral damage, uh, are dying. And how much do we need to be aware of this? Uh, how much can we absorb this kind of horror? Yes? Well, collateral damage is kind of like saying so it goes. Yes. Paraphrase. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. On the surface, just reading the book, I really enjoyed the journey, just the journey through the pages. But what I take away from it was the alien point of view that moments of time, people just will always exist in those moments that have passed. So if we pay attention to the present, we can better preserve other people in these moments if we choose to be that way. If we choose, and there is where maybe free will comes in. Actually, we can make that choice. We have that opportunity to make that choice. Again, an excellent reading. It was, I, I read it in the 70s, um, and the absurdity, the obscenity, and the humor all mixed together was a reflection of who I was. I left the United States for, during, for about seven years, and it was right around the time I read Slaughterhouse Five. I, ne I knew nothing about Dresden. I knew nothing about that history. And <coughs> laughing along with Vonnegut at the same time that you talk about the aliens, I got it then because it was taking me a little bit away from having to look at the horrors of war. And I just left. And it's Where did you go? Ecuador. I was in the Peace Corps. And then I stayed. And I stayed. And I stayed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sounds like you miss Ecuador. Uh, no, no, I just was missing. Um, it was, when I left, it was either going to be Richard Nixon or me. And he went to Ecuador, so. Uh, but Vonnegut has stayed with me. I, I reread his books occasionally. and. He still is a great teacher and a great humorist. Yeah, what an impact that had on you, yeah. obviously. That's, that's wonderful. Um, I mean, wh who can ask more, not only from a novel, but what novelist can act more, ask more than to have that kind of impact that was just described for us? How about some of the rest of you? Yes. Yeah, I read it a couple years ago. A couple. Yeah, I read it a couple years ago in two days on the backpacking trip. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I felt that it was kind of a lesson that we don't have to these people that can see our future, and we don't have to repeat the horrors of war that humanity has been keep on repeating, and we have the beauty of choice. So you got the message that we had, both of you did to some extent, we had the choice to stop war, yeah, to, to bring secession to war? Yeah. yeah, we don't have to be stupid and just keep accepting war and seeing it as an inevitable part of humanity. Yeah. And we can actually maybe, instead of just finding ways to change war, to stop. But that's just the opposite of so it goes, isn't it? The resignation I spoke of. In other words, let me walk away from uh, a novel like uh, Slaughterhouse Five feeling that maybe there is an onus upon you in terms of your free will to, uh, I don't know, be an anti-war or be involved in the anti-war movement, which you're looking at someone who was, by the way, not necessarily inspired by Slaughterhouse Five, but you know, I just hated the war, the Vietnam War, and felt that it was wrong, and frankly also felt that um, uh, I didn't want to be conscripted into it, um, which was also, you know, part of. I mean, so people will often ask the question, why was there not as much mobilization against the war, well, the first Persian Gulf War, or the war in Iraq, or even going further back to Korea War, 
Uh, but the Korean War also involved the draft. But it was mainly the draft that served to mobilize opposition to the Vietnam War. But how I many have found that Vonnegut was making you just feel stronger about opposition to war in general? <coughs> Good. Uh, I, I think it's important to realize that there is a teaching element in this novel. Uh, all too often, by the way, we have a lot of literary critics who say, a work of art should be a work of art. You know, it's the aesthetics, it's the language, it's the stylistics. These are the things that we revere, these are the things that we venerate in great works of literature. They shouldn't have to teach us, they shouldn't take us by the lapels and shake us and make us feel politicized by the novel. Well, guess what? Good novels can politicize, and do, and even poetry can. You know, there's, I don't know how many of you have read the poetry of the First World War by the English poets, by the British poets like uh, Siegfried Sassoon, Randolph Bourne, you know these names? Um, Robert Gray. I mean, these were incredibly powerful poems. I mean, at first, they were poems about the glory of war. And then, as there were woundings, and as there were amputations, and as there were deaths, and all of the horror of war, and war has become much more technological now, and in some ways much more destructive. Uh, I mean, this was trench warfare in World War I. But, as I said, it was one of the most stupid wars, perhaps. I hate to make it, you know, sound, I sound like the guy on the radio. This is, you know, it's the biggest no-brainer since the, uh, what did you say? It's the biggest no-brainer since the beginning of mankind, um, and it's commercials about loaning you money. Um, <laughs> I listen to other stations from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> I hear commercials. But, you know, I mean, a grand sweeping statement like I'm making here sounds absurd, but it probably was one of the dumbest wars. All, all wars are pretty dumb, but World War I, if you know about the assassination of the Archduke and how it started, uh, and, and all of our greatest writers of that period, I mean, T.S. Eliot, Mr. Pound, Hemingway, I mean, went to great lengths to show us how stupid that war was. And Hemingway actually had, you know, first hand experience of it. He was in the Italian ambulance corps. But you read a novel like this, or you go to the poets, like those British poets, and you see that whole recognition, that illumination of just how stupid and futile and unnecessary so many wars are. Now, I'm not making a brief for being a pacifist here, and I don't think Vonnegut is either. I remember talking to Vonnegut about war, and Vonnegut, like probably most reasonable people, thought, well, if you have to defend the homeland, if it comes down to security, your neck, as opposed to whoever's trying to cut your neck, of course you have to have a war. Sometimes wars are of necessity. But so many wars are not. And, I mean, did we really have to go into Iraq? Were there any weapons of mass destruction? I mean, some people thought we were surprised again when Colin Powell, former Secretary of State, came out today in support of Obama. I wasn't surprised because Poor Colin Powell went to the United Nations, stood at that blackboard and said, here are the weapons of mass destruction. For a man who had a distinguished career as a general, was really a remarkable diplomat, that was one of the most humiliating and, and, and indignant things that he had to go through. But he went through it, and he was indicted for it. And he, I mean, not literally, not legally, but indicted by the critics, and deserved to be indicted for it. But now he sees Obama as more, I suppose, at least in his mind, from what he said, someone who's leading us to peace. Who could understand war better than a general? These guys like Bush who never served in the military, they didn't understand really what war was. Uh, maybe even one could say that Obama and Romney don't understand what war was because neither one of them served in the military. And you know, there's Obama sending out drones. It's kind of commander-in-chief time, okay, I'm gonna look. It almost seems like, you know, everybody thought that he was this Pacific, easygoing guy, you know, uh, after the first debate, uh, Still doggy dog was sending a tweet saying, uh, brother, stop smoking that grass. You know, you're a little bit too laid back. Um, there was this perception that Obama was really, really very easygoing, a Pacific guy and everything. But he seems to be enjoying setting those drones up. Uh, I mean, it's like he decides where to send them, and they go. Other responses in terms of how the novel affected you? Yes? At first, I was upset by so it goes until I noticed that um, it was a response to these absurd deaths. And so when I looked at it, I saw that really the soap goes, is a, it's, it's brilliant because it's a statement of resignation at this absurdity, you know, the absurdity and the randomness of, of death. And um, if we don't want to be resigned to accepting this 
brutality, this norm, normality of brutality, you know, that was wars is, um, forces us to accept what's unacceptable. And if we don't want to go there, then we have to do something about it. So yeah. he's pushing us to you know, reject the normality of this brutalization of us. And that, that's why it's brutal. Yeah, thank you for but, this. But in the beginning, it really just came off. <laughs> you know, my first reaction was, oh no, I'm not going to ever accept this. Until I realized that you don't have a choice when it's happening. You uh, yeah. were pulled in. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to survive, you have to uh, deal with it. Push the boulder. Yeah. yeah, well said. You know, though, that, that, that does remind me that um, it's from the, from the private's point of view, from the foot soldier's point right. of view. And there's a lot of things in there about what the captains and the lieutenants and the higher-ups experience as opposed to the foot soldier who, after all, has taken orders. And so, so it goes. I mean, it's the, it's the infantryman who gets his face in the dirt. Have any of you read Tim O'Brien? <laughs> you know his work? Yeah. Uh, it's a good example. Um, the things they carried is a novel by Tim O'Brien, who was in the Vietnam War, was a soldier in the Vietnam War, an infantryman, a grunt, as they call him. Yeah. And boy, you get to talk about the feeling of how uh, dissociated you are in terms of time and reading Slaughterhouse Five. You read Tim O'Brien, who probably might not have been Tim O'Brien if it hadn't been for writers like Bonnie and John Morgan, and kind of give you this linear sense of a nonlinear novel and then they go to the importance of intertextuality. Tim O'Brien gives you a feeling of just having to carry all of the weight, and it's not only physical weight, you know, they carry into war, into the, into the villages of Vietnam, uh, where innocents are killed, and where soldiers are killed, and where mines can blow up at any time, and so forth. But it's just that sense of constant pervasive danger and imminence of death, and the realization of just how carrying that sense of how vulnerable you are, and carrying many other emotional uh, onuses as well with you as you trudge along as a grunt into war. Remember, there were a lot of works that were written. How I many of you know Catch 22, for example? Okay. Uh, you know, a great novel by Joseph Heller, which was made into a film, um, as was Slaughterhouse Five, not nearly as successful a film uh, as uh, Catch 22. But there was a sense, again, of the absurdity and, and, uh, in, in Heller's work, in O'Brien's work, of war and of what we think of as this inhuman arena where uh, human beings destroy other human beings. The absurd, which you just pointed out again, is really in many ways a key word here. What, you know what Camus meant by the absurd? I mean, essentially, like I said, the myth of Sisyphus rolling a boulder up the hill, but there was also a sense that in terms of my own subjective consciousness, my own individuality, my own self, I look at the world outside of me and the other human beings outside of me, and there's a distance, there's a gap, there's a chasm between the two. And what he's saying is, that essentially is the irrationality of human existence. That's where he becomes kind of one of the real pioneers of existential thinking, that the gap that exists between our consciousness and the world outside us, you know, that it's like go all the way back to Descartes and Cartesian philosophy, coquito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. I think I am, and therefore I think there's something outside of what I am, right? There's a distance between me as subject and the object that I perceive outside of myself. And that distance is irrational. That distance can't be, it's a chasm, it's a gap, it's a gulf. It can't really be brought together. Now, unless you're a mystic or a believer, unless you have a leap of faith or you have some notion that there's a greater power, then you could perhaps bring them together. But otherwise, and by the way, there are uh, religious and theological existentialists. Um, everybody thinks existentialism means atheism or means heaven for fend agnosticism. Some of you may know I wrote a book on agnosticism and I, uh, called Spiritual Envy, which I like to describe as, um, well, <laughs> I once interviewed Studs Terkel, the great uh, uh, oral historian, and, I, and he said he was an agnostic. He said, well, I'm interested in agnosticism. I'm writing a book on it. How do you define agnosticism? He said, well, I'm an agnostic. I said, what does that mean to you? Said, it means I'm a cowardly atheist. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not all equivalent existentialism and godlessness or lack of belief in anything. Uh, agnostics, I discovered through my research, are essentially people who ask questions and say they don't know. And sometimes it takes a certain courage to say, I don't know. 
I always love that old Mort Solomon by a family of agnostics who move into a neighborhood and somebody burned a question mark on their lawn. Uh, <laughs> but Kierkegaard, you know the name? Sorry, Kierkegaard, the great Danish philosopher. I mean, he was an existentialist. He's almost a quintessential existentialist, but he was also very much a believer. He took that leap of faith. And he believed in God, and he was uh, very strong in his Christianity. So existentialism doesn't necessarily equate, equate with lack of belief in God. But Vonnegut, I'll tell you, Vonnegut was an atheist. <laughs> I mean, I think there's very little doubt about that. Uh, it wasn't as if he came out and said, I'm an atheist, you know. Um, no, he did, uh, in not so many words. But read Cat's Cradle, for those of you who have a taste now for Vonnegut and see what he does with God, and with the whole notion of God. And God as an omnipotent, overseeing, you know. It was great watching Ryan Bogosan pitch that game the other day, but you know, there were people who were a little surprised afterward when he said, God has a plan for me. And I could almost hear somebody like Vonnegut's voice saying, why does he have a plan for you? Why are you so important? You know? <laughs> this baseball game means that much where, you know, it's all in God's plan. What about all those people who are suffering and hunger and impoverished and you know, dying in wars and so forth? Does God have a plan for them? Is that part of God's plan? No, and so it goes. And so it goes. It's probably time for me to end. Thank you. <laughs>